public service. He was supposed to have a microphone, the things. And he was just completely free with that. Bom dia. Boa. Boa tarde, pessoal. Good afternoon. So uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Brent Williams, who is an assistant professor from Columbia University, from the Center of Infection and Immunity, the Department of um, Epidemiology. We've been collaborating for a few years now. So Brent is uh, spending two weeks with us as a visiting professor. So I would like to acknowledge CAPES and our program here to helping us figure this out and host, uh, host Brent here. It's been really interesting. He's giving a lecture. We've gone through three of those. I think some of you guys have been there. So he's going to give this seminar to the students today, and um, I hope you guys follow and like the seminar. Thank you, Brent. Thanks for that introduction, Gilberto. Um, it's really been a pleasure to be here and uh, to visit Rio for the first time. Uh, so far, I've spent most of my time in a lecture room, <laughs> but this, this weekend, I'm going to definitely be out, out on the beaches if the weather permits. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about the collaboration that I have with Gilberto that I think it's been about three years in the making. And it's still ongoing, but we do have some uh, preliminary results from the study that we've been working on. Um, and the title of my talk is Exploring the Impact of Maternal and Infant Microbiomes on Postpartum and Infant Health Outcomes in a Brazilian Cohort. So just a little background. I actually work on a wide range of topics everything from colorectal cancer, breast cancer, um, infections of the female reproductive tract. I'm working with the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa to try to understand how the vaginal microbiome impacts HIV transmission. Um, I also study stillbirth and how placental and fetal infections can be contributing to uh, increased prevalence of stillbirth. Um, I'm also interested in maternal and infant health. Um, I have several publications looking at the microbiome in autism. Um, and this particular study with Gilberto, uh, we are uh, looking at some aspects of how maternal antibiotic exposure during pregnancy may impact health and disease. Um, everything from Kawasaki disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, Western lowland gorillas, um, and post-infectious hydrocephalus. But the common theme to all of these studies, even though it's a wide range of topics, is microbiome and what role the microbiome plays in, dis in disease. Uh, so the microbiome it defines the microbial communities and their genomes of an environment. Uh, these uh, uh, the microbiome consists of all bacteria, viruses, fungi, archaea, and single-celled eukaryotes. Um, humans and other animals have a microbiome, plants, soil, the built environment, there's sort of microbiome all around us. Um, and I know I covered some of this in my lectures, but everyone may not be here, so just to sort of go over some definitions. The microbiome refers to all of the genes in a microbial community, whereas the microbiota refers to the community members, so all of the bacterial taxa uh, present in that community. Dysbiosis is a term that we use to describe a dysregulation or an abnormal microbiota. So it's sort of outside the norm of what we see typically in individuals. And Dysbiosis is commonly found in many diseases, including diabetes, colorectal cancer, and inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, you can sort of think of ourselves as superorganisms because we're composed of both uh, human cells as well as bacterial cells. And there are actually, uh, original estimates suggested that there were 10 times more microbial cells in, the, in and on the human body than there are human cells. 
but more recent estimates suggest that that uh, ratio is closer to one to one, but we're still more micro microbial than we are human. Um, and the weight of our entire microbiome is around three pounds, which is the approximate weight of our own brain. Uh, the microbiome of each individual is unique and it's environmentally acquired uh, with each generation. So you have a different microbial signature than I have, and everyone in this room has their own unique microbial signature. Uh, microbes have influenced our genetic diversity. Our own human genome encodes 23,000 human genes, whereas all of the microbes in our body uh, encode 8 million genes. So there are actually 350 times more bacterial genes in our body than there are human genes. And these genes th and the products that these genes produce and the metabolism that bacteria um, undertake uh, plays an important role in normal physiology. An example is, uh, comes from our inability to digest uh, plant food. Um, because we don't actually encode in our genome the requisite enzymes to break down certain plant carbohydrates. Um, our bacteria, on the other hand, encode a wide range of glycoside hydrolases and polysaccharide lyases that then allow us in our gastrointestinal tract to break down those plant materials and extract energy from plants. And the, the uh, metabolism of these bacteria uh, play important roles in maintaining a healthy state uh, for humans and only about 1% of these microbes in our body can actually be cultured. Uh, but besides digestion uh, and, uh, of carbohydrates in our diet and breaking down food compounds, our microbiome actually plays a uh, has a wide range of functions in human physiology. Um, everything from biosynthesizing vitamins and amino acids to the metaboli metabolism of drugs, uh, promotion of angiogenesis, um, and even modification of the nervous system. Uh, so we have essentially evolved along with these microbes to have this symbiotic relationship where we're kind of feeding these microbes with the food that we intake, but they're performing all of these additional functions that really help, help to promote normal physiology and human health. And we don't just have one human microbiome, we have several, um, and they are, those microbiomes differ by body type. So the gut microbiome is different than the skin microbiome, which is different than the oral microbiome um, and the vaginal microbiome. There have been some studies that have reported that there's a placental microbiome, but um, if, if you attended my last lecture, it's been suggested that that's actually a result of contamination. And each of these microbiomes have been uh, associated with different diseases. So the gut microbiome, which is probably the most widely studied, is, has been associated with obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, diabetes, uh, clostridium difficile infection, colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, and even psychiatric disorders. Um, in contrast, skin microbiome is associated with allergies, acne, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, the oral microbiome associated with periodontal disease, um, and vaginal microbiome associated with bacterial vaginosis as well as, sexual, as sexually transmitted diseases. So today I'm going to be talking about this collaboration that I have with Gilberto. Um, in which we are trying to assess the importance of the microbiome in Brazilian pregnant women on maternal and infant health. So Gilberto and his team 
uh, recruited 151 pregnant women for this study. And the inclusion criteria were that the women should be between 18 and 40 years old, um, between 28 and 35 uh, weeks of gestation when they're recruited. Uh, they should be free from chronic and non-communicable diseases except obesity, um, and free from infectious diseases, and with singleton pregnancies. Um, exclusion criteria um, were exclusion of women with gestational pathologies such as preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, a history of preterm birth, women who did not intend to exclusively breastfeed until one month postpartum, and those women who did not exclusively breastfeed or predominantly breastfeed until 28 days postpartum. And those women who used any prenatal antibiotic uh, one month prior to recruitment. So in terms of what data was being collected, a wide range was data of data was collected from these women. This is only a small portion of that, but, um, and samples were collected for maternal stool and breast milk as well as the infant stool. Uh, maternal mental health was assessed. Uh, using the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, the mini, mini interview, neuropsychiatric interview, the PHQ-9, and the straight in, sta state and trade anxiety or inventory. And infant development was followed using the ages and stages uh, scales. Also, anthropometric measures were taken, lifestyle factors were recorded, and diet was assessed with 24-hour recalls or food frequency questionnaires. Uh, in addition, Gilberto and his team, working with other collaborators, um, were measured um, human milk oligosaccharides in breast milk, as well as breast milk micronutrients. And feel free to stop me at any time if anyone has any questions. So this is the general scheme for the study in terms of the uh, longitudinal schedule for recruitment, data collection, and sampling. So women were recruited at interview one, which was between 28 and uh, 35 gestational weeks. At that time, stool, blood, and blood were collected from the women. Uh, socioeconomic, demographic, lifestyle, and women, women's health questionnaires were applied, fruit frequency questionnaires, and then the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression, MINI, and STAI to assess women's mental health, um, as well as anthropometric measures. Then three to seven days, interview two, again, samples were collected. Uh, questionnaires were applied, anthropometric measures, um, and from the stool and and stool was collected from neonates at this time point. Uh, this also uh, similarly occurred at one month, three months, uh, six months, and twelve months. And I'm primarily highlighting here interview three, which is the one month time point because so far that's where we've begun to look at the microbiome in this study, although we plan to assess the microbiome in this entire, um, over the, this entire longitudinal. I'm sorry? Tryptophan. Are we assessing tryptophan metabolites? So this, it's a little bit complicated, so it's part of this study also blood and, um, plasma and serum were collected. So this is a part of our plan to assess tryptophan metabolites in the uh, plasma and serum of the mother. We've applied for uh, NIH R01 grant, which we will hopefully find out in February that, that this has been funded, uh, so that we can actually pay for all of those things. But yes, that's something that we're planning to look at in this study. So these, the interaction between mothers and infants is somewhat complex, and especially in terms of the microbiome. 
So there are obviously factors like diet, lifestyle, and antibiotic use that can have an impact on the mother's gut microbiome. And then the mother's gut microbiome could further influence outcomes in the mother, such as uh, increased BMI, uh, maternal depression, maternal anxiety. And then we don't really know how maternal to infant transmission of microbiome may affect the infant gut microbiome, or how any of these factors like the maternal diet and lifestyle uh, uh, or antibiotic treatment may also have impacts on the infant. Uh, we also have additional things that can be affecting the infant gut microbiome, such as breastfeeding, whether the infants were born by cesarean section or vaginally, and again, antibiotics given to the infant postpartum. And we'll be, in this study, we plan to look at how the infant gut microbiome may be associated with growth, cognition, as well as other health factors. Uh, we also have the mother's breast milk microbiome. So in addition to um, HMOs and micronutrients, which Gilberto has measured, we'll be able to look at how these factors of the breast milk microbiome may be influenced by maternal diet, lifestyle, and antibiotics, or any of the um, clinical outcomes of those are associated with breast milk microbiome and carbohydrate composition and then how those may also play a role in infant microbiome development. So there's a lot of moving parts, but really a lot of things that we can look at in this study. Um, so what have we done so far? So we have performed microbiome analysis using 16S rRNA gene sequencing from 54 mothers stool at one month postpartum, 58 infant stool at one month, post, one month, one month postpartum, and 63 bre breast milk samples from the mothers at one mo month postpartum. And then Gilberto and his, with his collaborators Lars Bode and Daniela Hample have looked at uh, human milk oligosaccharides and breast milk micronutrients. And from the data that we actually obtained from these analyses, uh, we had sufficient preliminary data to apply for an R01 from the National Institutes of Health. Um, as, and as I mentioned, hopefully that will find it. <laughs> so when we look at the microbiome of these three sites that we're sampling, we can see that they're very different. They separate in principal coordinate analysis, with the mother's microbiome separating furthest from the infant and the breast milk, and then the infant microbiome and breast milk microbiome separate along the second principal coordinate. But it tells us really that the microbiome at each of these sites is very distinct. We also can look at alpha diversity of the microbiome in the mothers and the infants. And we see that the mothers have the highest diversity of the mi in the microbiome, meaning they have more species, more richness of bacteria compared to the infants in the breast milk microbiome. We can also look at what bacteria kind of differentiate these three types of microbiome. In the infant microbiome, they have more Enterobacteriaceae, more Bacteroides, and more Bifidobacterium. In the mother's uh, stool microbiome, there's more Prebatella, Ruminococcus, Bacaly bacterium, and Acromantia. And then in breast milk, there's more Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and a few other taxa. Yes? So alpha diversity, I sort of, I went over this in, in my lectures, but alpha diversity is really looking at how many bacterial taxa are there, and there are different metrics of alpha diversity that look at different things. So it's looking at the richness of the population, the evenness of the population of bacteria present, as well as 
combinations of richness and evenness based on different metrics. This one is, uh, um, the, this metric here that was used is observed OTUs, which just means how many species are present within those samples, how many total species. But um, the other, typically we assess multiple metrics and all of the metrics that we assessed showed the same pattern. Uh, beta diversity, on the other hand, is really looking at the, comp the overall composition. So how different is the composition? This metric is a weighted unifrax metric, which takes into account both the phylogeny, so how closely related bacteria are um, taxonomically, as well as the abundance of different bacterial taxa. So it's kind of looking at the composition of the microbiome overall and how different are they. Uh, so here you can see the mother's stool microbiota reflected in a bar chart and you see there's a huge amount of variation between individuals, you see there's this enormous um, um, diversity. So each of these little colors all along represents an individual genera. Uh, so this, the mother stool is highly diverse. You can see that some women have very high levels of this bacteria Prevotella. So it's been shown in other populations that Prevotella is dominant in individuals that consume primarily plant-based diets. The other bacteria that's most dominant here, shown in blue, is Bacteroides. And in other populations, this has been shown to vary across populations based on meat consumption. So these there's something called enterotypes of the human microbiome where individuals sort of separate into one of two populations based on how much Prevotella they have and how much Bacteroides they have. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out in these women was that there's, there was something very unique that I saw here, which I circled in black for these three women. And these three women actually have very high levels of treponema. So I have never seen this before in any women. So there's, there's something very unique about these women because the only place that you usually see this are in hunter-gatherer populations around the world that are ba basically uh, sort of untouched by society. So um, it was first reported in the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania. So these women, uh, you know, it would be very interesting to find out what exactly is their diet, what is it that they're eating, because at least in Western populations like the United States and in the majority of the women here, we don't have this bacteria. Um, so, and we don't actually understand why we've lost this bacteria because they've actually looked at coprolites, which are fossilized uh, feces from prehistoric, or prehistoric humans, and they find treponema in those prehistoric humans. So something about our diet has caused diet or lifestyle has caused us to lose these bacteria. So we only see it in these populations like the Hadza hunter-gatherers, the Tanapuco of Peru, uh, but there are a few women here in Rio that seem to have these, <laughs> these very unique bacteria. Um, and especially this woman, Eve. Uh, physical? Uh, it could be physical activity, but these we also see these treponema in our closest living relatives, the uh, chimpanzees and gorillas. And they form part of a fibrolytic um, consortium. 
So we actually think that their association with the human microbiome is more related to having very unique fibers in your diet. So in the Hadza hunter-gatherers, for instance, they actually chew on roots uh, quite frequently. And so they're getting a lot of fiber from these fibrous roots. Uh, but in, you know, in U.S. population, we know that we consume much lower levels of fiber. We have all of these antibiotics. But I thought it was worthwhile to point out that there's some, some very interesting uh, results in this cohort. Uh, in the breast milk microbiota, you can see here Streptococcus and Staphylococcus, Streptococcus being the most dominant. Um, bifidobacterium is actually relatively low in this population, and I'll show that on the next slide. Uh, but Streptococcus and Staphylococcus are definitely the most dominant uh, taxa that we're seeing. Um, and in the infant stool microbiome, we, see, we can see how it's much less diverse than the mothers. So if you remember, the mothers have all these different taxa. The infants at one month postpartum have a dominance. There's a dominance typically of one or a few bacteria. And mostly these infants are dominated by Enterobacteriaceae, shown in green, Bifidobacterium, shown in this dark gray, uh, Escherichia coli, or E. coli, shown in brown, and Bacteroides, shown in pink. So we don't know why some of these infants are dominated by one of these taxa and others are dominated by others. Um, and we don't know how these differences may be impacting infant health. So that's some of the things that we want to try to figure out in these, this study. And if you look at bifidobacterium, which is considered a very healthy uh, bacteria for infants, we can look at that bacteria specifically across each sample type. Um, because it's thought that the bifidobacteria that infants have comes from the mother. Here we can see bifidobacterium in breast milk. It's present, but it's present at pretty low levels. But it could still be seeding the microbiome of infants. And you can see that the infants have variable levels in terms of the amount of bifidobacterium that they have, but they have relatively high levels. And then if we look at the mother's stool, we actually see that the mother's stool has more bifidobacterium than the breast milk. So it's more likely that bifidobacterium in mother's stool may be a source for infants. And there's actually been a study looking at strain-specific tracing of bifidobacterium from mothers to infants. And what they found was that the majority of bacteria that get transferred to the infant actually comes from the mother's gastrointestinal tract, which a lot of the earlier studies sort of suggested that infant colonization was more related to vaginal microbiome uh, because that's the first exposure if an infant is born vaginally, but that's not necessarily the case. In the very, you know, in the very early time periods, and maybe like the first one to three days, you do see those vaginal bacteria, but then they go away uh, pretty quickly and begin to become colonized with uh, mother stool bacteria. Um, so there are potential far-reaching consequences of microbial dysbiosis in, on child health. I've sort of divided this in to factors that influence the microbiome, uh, the physiological consequences of the microbiome, and then potential adverse outcomes. So in terms of what can influence the vaginal microbiome, things like maternal health and the maternal microbiome, the mode of birth, whether they're vaginally or cesarean born, if they're prematurely born, uh, breast milk, whether they're formula fed or given breast milk, uh, antibiotic exposures, post-weaning diet, uh, whether they're 
they're born in an urban or rural environment, um, other environmental contaminants, uh, and also genetics. So genetics does play a role to some extent in forming the microbiome. And then in terms of what those bacteria are doing in the infants, they're providing pathogen resistance, so they're preventing other potentially bad bacteria from colonizing. They make vitamins that are important to uh, health and um, human development. Uh, they, me they metabolize drugs and chemicals. Um, they, of course, metabolize components of the diet. They play a role in angiogenesis, bone development, brain development, gastrointestinal development, and the immune system development. So these are the potential adverse outcomes of dysbiosis in infancy, susceptibility to infection, childhood obesity, allergies and atopic diseases, cognitive development, hypertension and atherosclerosis, cancer, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, psychiatric disorders later in life, uh, drug toxicity, uh, vitamin deficiency, metabolome imbalances, autoimmunity, type 2 diabetes, and the list goes on and on. So the microbiome uh, could be playing a very important role in infant health and development. And um, so a lot of these factors I've already gone over through development, but mode of delivery and gestational age of birth are important. Uh, feeding, breast milk versus formula feeding, geographic location is important, uh, host interactions, maternal diet, and then when infants are weaned from their mothers, so how long are they breastfed? Yeah. Uh, so this would be somewhat indirect. So there's still competing suggestions as to whether the placenta is, has a microbiome. Most microbiome researchers think that it does not, that it's a sterile site, except in conditions of disease or infection. So there have been, there are infections that lead to, um, to preterm rupture of membranes, infection of the placenta, but generally in healthy pregnancies, we think that the placenta is sterile. But that doesn't mean that alterations to the mother's microbiome can't have physiological effects on the placenta. And that, that's sort of um, the route by which I think this, is, this pl comes into play. So we know if the m we know at least from experimental models that the microbiome plays an important role in tryptophan metabolism, and tryptophan is very important for gestational development of the of the fetal brain. So the maternal changes in the maternal microbiome influencing tryptophan metabolism then could be indirectly impacting gestational development. Um, so we're really interested in sort of how these early life changes could impact infection, um, uh, atopy, diabetes development, IBD, IBS, all of these factors could be influenced. So in terms of what we've begun to look at in this Brazilian cohort, uh, we've looked at cesarean section versus vaginal birth, exclusive breastfeeding versus non-exclusive breastfeeding, maternal antibiotic treatment, maternal pre-pregnancy BMI, above normal versus normal, and also we looked at infant colic. Uh, in which is severe, often fluctuating pain in the abdomen caused by intestinal gas or obstruction in the intestines, and it's especially suffered in uh, babies. Uh, so from the infants, we had 58 infants that we have so far 
um, evaluated the microbiome with 16S RNA sequencing. Um, we had a cesarean section, about 20, um, sorry, my vision is blurred there, Tw about 27% compared to 73% vaginally born. Um, only two were preterm, exclusive breastfeeding, uh, 20, about 45% compared to 54%, and antibiotics used at delivery or 30 days postpartum. 17 women had taken an antibiotic, 41 had not. So when we looked at first vaginal versus cesarean section, we actually see that based on uh, alpha diversity, we don't see any differences at one month postpartum in the infants. Um, there's no change in the number of species present. Uh, but when we look at the composition of the microbiota based on vaginally born versus cesarean section using weighted unifrac metric, which takes into account phylogeny and abundance of the bacteria, we can see that there's actually a significant difference. So vaginal versus cesarean section is having an impact on the infant microbiome, and it's extending all the way out to one month postpartum. And here, we then look at what bacteria differentiate infants born by cesarean delivery versus those born by vaginal delivery. And you can see that there's a wide range of taxa that differentiate these infants. Uh, for those born vaginally, they have more bacteroides, more parabacteroides, but these are not, are, these are bacteria that you would typically see in mother's stool. They're not vaginal bacteria, um, except one, Megaspira. That's the only bacteria that I know in this list that is commonly found in the vaginal tract. And, and then for cesarean born infants, they have more Clostridia, Morganella, all these enterococcus, so very different types of bacteria are found in cesarean-born infants compared to vaginally-born infants. Um, and I mentioned that some of the, you know, most abundant bacteria are actually uh, bacteroides in these infants. So this may be one of the factors that's determining why some infants have high levels of bacteroides. Uh, in the vaginal, in the vaginally born, this is much more common than it is in the cesarean born infants. Um, and then when we looked at um, pre-pregnancy BMI, uh, this is work that Natalia is working on. Uh, we did not see any difference in um, alpha diversity for any of the metrics based on the maternal pre-pregnancy BMI in terms of their microbiome. Uh, we also did not see any differences in beta diversity based on pre-pregnancy BMI. So that doesn't seem to be a factor necessarily, but there are a lot of other ways that Natalia is looking into this data, looking at gestational weight gain, and I think probably we'll also be looking at third trimester weight or BMI as another factor uh, to see if sort of BMI closer to the time of when we're looking at the microbiome may be more important. Um, but just because there's not differences in alpha and beta diversity, it doesn't mean there aren't differences in bacteria. And we did find that there were four taxa in above normal pre-pregnancy BMI that differed in the infants one month postpartum. Uh, Haemophilus influenza is an important organism that actually causes infections in infants. And so we're looking further into uh, that finding to see whether, whether this may represent an infection. Uh, when we looked at non-exclusive breastfeeding versus exclusive breastfeeding, we didn't see difference between differences between um, alpha and beta diversity or alpha diversity. 
but we did find a large number of bacterial taxa that differentiate infants that had exclusive breastfeeding versus those that had non-exclusive breastfeeding. So those with non-exclusive breastfeeding also have this homophila parainfluenza that we saw with women with pre-pregnancy BMI. So these sort of things that we consider to be negative in terms of uh, pregnancy with non-exclusive <coughs> breastfeeding or above normal BMI may be opening up to infants to increased risk of infection. <coughs> Sorry, it's my second talk today. <laughs> and you can see that in ex exclusive breastfed infants, there are a lot of taxa that are much more abundant in the breastfed infants, including lactobacillus, um, pseudomonas, enterococcus, uh, so there may be some aspects of increased diversity when we do the, when we complete the larger study. Right now we're only limited to 58 infants, but there's definitely more taxa that are at higher abundance in the exclusively breastfed infants. Yeah. Yes. From bottle. Yes, not not from the bottle, from the stock. They take uh um the 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 yes. They can do this because the the reason I am asking is because what is the impact of the team of the validation for this for the I see what you're saying, yeah. yeah. Right. So this I mean so it has been shown for oral microbes in infants that the oral microbes are different when they are breastfeeding from the mother. Um, and a lot of those are um, staph epidermidis, sort of skin bacteria that are on the breast. But we, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I think Gilberto would know better. So I don't think we have that that information, but it is a good question because does it make a difference if you're directly bre breastfeeding or from a bottle? Yeah, and and I mean I know there have been studies that have shown the oral microbiome is different that when they are actually breastfeeding. Uh, but I don't, I don't think there are any studies that have looked at the um, gut microbiome. And my guess would be that it, it really wouldn't have that much of an effect because we don't really see a lot of those breast milk bacteria except bifidobacterium in the infant stool. Do you know what I mean? Because streptococcus and staphylococcus don't colonize the gastrointestinal tract very easily. So those skin associated bacteria wouldn't likely grow very well in the gastrointestinal tract. Oh, I didn't even go through this one. Um, so we also looked at mothers who it were administered um, antibiotics during delivery or within 30 days postpartum. And you can see that individuals who took antibiotics, or mothers that took antibiotics, their infants had different bacteria one month postpartum compared to those that did not take any antibiotics. And then finally, we wanted to look at sort of uh, infant health impact uh, from the microbiome. Uh, so we looked at colic at one month postpartum and how it related to the microbiome. 
and actually there was a significant difference. <coughs> I don't know why the p-value didn't show up here, but the p-value was 0 0.01, suggesting that infants with colic had lo significantly lower alpha diversity compared to infants without colic. And then when we look at what bacteria differentiate uh, infants with colic and without, we see that infant with infants with colic have higher abundance of Bacteroides fragilis and have lower levels of these other bacteria. Many of these bacteria are actually important uh, mucus degrading bacteria. So they live in the mucus layer of the gastrointestinal tract and, and they grow on the mucus layer and also stimulate turnover of the mucus. Uh, so there may be some mechanisms that are, are related to this. So we've talked about the infant and what we've looked at it with the infant so far. We have a lot of diff more analysis that we need to do. Uh, but we just sort of started looking at some of those basic factors that we know can influence the microbiome. Uh, but we also are interested in how uh, the microbiome influ influences the mother's health. And so one of the questions that I'm particularly interested in is whether antibiotics given uh, to mothers during or after pregnancy impact maternal mental health. So uh, there's been a, a lot of studies looking at factors that can impact the uh, microbiome. And in this study of 1,100 uh, individuals, they found that medications actually have the strongest impact on the microbiome. So that's one reason that it's important to look at how, um, how medications may impact um, maternal health. Um, antibiotics are a major cause of gut dysbiosis. Up to 40% of pregnant women receive antibiotics just prior to delivery. And during pregnancy, 60% of women are given antibiotics. By six months of age, up to 30% of children have received one course of antibiotics. And there are long-term impacts of uh, antibiotics on the gastrointestinal microbiome. And there's incomplete recovery that can last all the way up to a year. Uh, this could increase pathogen susceptibility, uh, leads to other physiological de derangements, inte intestinal, metabolic, immunological, and brain health. So we're interested in how the microbiome might play a role in maternal depression. And one way is through the gut-brain axis. There's actually a bi-directional communication between the intestine and the brain. Um, and we want to look at whether, and I'm interested in looking at whether disturbances in the microbiota affect brain function, mood, and behavior. Um, and how does this affect pregnant women and their infants um, and particularly, I'm interested in tryptophan and its metabolites, which are key players in the gut-brain axis and are also regulated in the gastrointestinal tract by bacteria. Uh, so there are just some important clinical studies that have been undertaken that also make this an important question. Um, it's been shown uh, in this study by Lurie, looking at over a million people, uh, that a single course of antibiotics increases the risk of depression and multiple courses of antibiotics further increases this risk. And penicillins actually had the highest risk of depression. And penicillins are the most common antibiotic given to pregnant women. And there is only one study in the literature that's even begun to look at this. Uh, this study, maternal peripartum antibiotic exposure and the risk of postpartum depression. So there were 124 women enrolled in this study. Women completed the Edinburgh post -po postnatal depression scale at 32 to 36 weeks of gestation, one and two weeks postpartum 
one month, two months, three months, and six mo months postpartum. And they found that antibiotic exposure was predictive of postpartum depression symptoms at one month and two months. However, there has been no evaluation of the microbiome in this study. So my interest in this really came from my initial studies in mouse models. And I'm not going to go through all of the details of what we did here, but I've been studying the mechanisms of, how of, of the impacts of antibiotics in pregnant mice. Uh, we essentially gave pregnant mice antibiotics three days prior to the birth of their litter in their drinking water. So those are, that's a very short course of antibiotics. And then we assessed how that impacted the mother's microbiome uh, using different types of antibiotics, some given orally, and then we also gave penicillin G as an injection. And what we found was that all of the antibiotics had impacts on the mother's microbiome. All of the antibiotics completely dysregulated intestinal gene expression for tryptophan metabolism, and also completely dysregulated the metabolites produced by tryptophan uh, metabolism. So there were increases in and, and this was not just in the intestine, but also in the serum. So you can imagine sort of during gestation, if you're having these very high levels of tryptophan as a result of antibiotics and less tryptophan metabolism, you're producing less serotonin, which is, of course, plays a, mood in in plays a role in mood and depression. Uh, the these extreme changes in, in metabolism could be important. We also looked at behavioral studies in these mice to see how the antibiotics were affecting the mother's behavior as well as the infant's behavior. And we found that m mothers that were given the antibiotics were hyperactive, had reduced anxiety, and had abnormal nurturing behaviors with their pups. In the infants, we found that they had delayed writing reflex, incre increased vocalizations, and even as they got older, th as the pups got older, they were just like their mothers, they became hyperactive. So, it, so then we wanted to look in the, Brazil in the Brazilian cohort that uh, Gilberto has and here we performed a logistic regression uh, to look at um, how antibiotics from the 36 women that received prenatal antibiotics in the third trimester, um, prior to the third trimester, compared to the 81 women that did not take prenatal antibiotics. And we found that depression was um, assessed in the third trimester with the EPDS was significant. So we're finding that, um, that there was an increased risk of depression in pregnant women in the third trimester if they had taken an antibiotic um, during pregnant, a prenatal antibiotic. Um, so Sort of, there are very complex ways of looking at the microbiome, and and for studies such as this one, we we are beginning to collect more and more data and more and more information, and so we need methods to apply methods where we can begin to integrate all of this very complex data, so all of this microbiome data, metabolomics data, uh, clinical information. Uh, so that we can see how all, all of these factors sort of are related. And more and more in science, people are turning toward network modeling and machine learning, uh, which allows you to combine accuracy and ease of interpretation. Um, i just skip that slide. Uh, so I work with one of these a machine learning uh, method called topological data analysis, 
where you can take these very large complex data sets and you can interrogate different factors within your entire data set to understand how all of the factors relate. So here we use topological data analysis to separate the women who took antibiotics during pregnancy from those who um, did not take antibiotics during pregnancy. And then we can look at all of the factors within our data set that are associated with this. So just as with our regression model, we see that pregnancy uh, depression based on ET EPDS at pregnancy was significantly associated with women taking antibiotics as well as at three months based on another depression scale, the pre PHQ-9. We also found that women who took the antibiotic were actually less anxious, significantly less anxious based on the state and state anxiety uh, in index. And that's actually, that seems sort of counterintuitive. You might be thinking that more anxiety um, or less anxiety is a good thing, but not necessarily in the context of, of infant care. And so this is actually exactly what we see in the mice, that the mice have that maternal mice given antibiotics have reduced anxiety and maternal mice given antibiotics have increased depression behaviors. Uh, we also see that there are associations with maternal BMI. It's kind of well known now that antibiotics have an effect on weight gain. And we're seeing that women who took antibiotics are having significant association with increased BMI at six months and 12 months, so much later on um, as using, looking at BMI as a continuous variable as well as it using it as a, as a categorical variable where uh, women were more likely to be obese if they had taken an antibiotic um, six months later. We also looked at infant outcomes associated with this, these antibiotic treat, treatment or no antibiotic treatment. And we found that the weight for length, z-scores of the infants was significantly lower in the women who took antibiotics. The BMI for age was significantly lower in the women who took antibiotics at three months and the wa overall weight was significantly lower at 12 months. And we also looked at development using the ages and stages uh, questionnaire and gross motor skills as well as fine motor skills were significantly lower in uh, the infants from the mothers that had taken antibiotics. In terms of what microbiome differences were present, we saw that the mothers had decreased alpha diversity at one month postpartum. Keep in mind these women took the antibiotic uh, one month, at least one month prior to recruitment. So this is overall around three months later, the mother's microbiome still has reduced um, alpha diversity. We found that they had lower levels of acromantia. Acromantia is an important bacteria involved uh, that has been associated with leanness. So the more ac acromantia you have, the leaner you have. Uh, typically with obesity, you find that this bacteria is either absent or uh, at much lower levels than in lean individuals. Uh, in the breast milk, we found that women who took antibiotics uh, had changes in Staphylococcus, bac uh, Bifidobacterium infantis, lower levels of these, uh, lower levels of E. coli. So these antibiotics may even be impacting the bacteria present in breast milk that's being transferred to the infant. And then in the infants at one month postpartum, we also see that those infants have lower uh, alpha diversity, but we're only seeing a trend that didn't reach significance. 
and they have lower levels of E. coli, which we see the mothers had lower levels of E. coli. They also have lower levels of acromantia. We see the mothers had lower levels of acromantia. So there may be sort of direct effects of the mother taking an antibiotic on what bacteria then gets transferred to the infant. Um, we've also seen that if we just look at depressed women at one month postpartum, so now this is not looking at depression at pregnancy, but looking at one month postpartum, and we look at uh, alpha diversity in the mothers, we see a trend for depressed individuals to have lower alpha diversity. We also see that based that depressed women separate from non-depressed women based on the beta diversity. Um, and you can see that here, that all of the um, beta diversity metrics that we applied showed extremely significant p-values, suggesting that the microbiome of depressed women is much different than the microbiome of non-depressed women. Uh, so in summary, we've shown um, that we're interested in whether the microbiome may be an important determinant of health um, for infants and mothers during and after pregnancy. Uh, we're still in the process of looking at the factors that are affecting the maternal microbiome and, and how those microbes may be transferred to the infants. Uh, we uh, know that there's a wide range of pre- and postnatal factors that can influence the development of the infant microbiome uh, with p potential implications for disease in both mothers and infants. And we've begun, only begun to explore s these factors within the Brazilian mothers and their infants in the first study of its kind in Rio. So for future directions, uh, Fingers crossed, pray, whatever your religion is, <laughs> so that we can get funding to continue this. Um, and our other our research plans are to complete the microbiome sequencing on all of the mothers and infants at all time points, so that we can really have this data set complete and really be able to address a, a lot of these other questions. And then to integrate, micro eventually integrate microbiome, breast milk HMOs, uh, breast milk micronutrient data to have a more complete understanding of how all of these factors interact and hopefully to enjoy many more years of collaboration in our efforts to promote the health of mothers and their infants in Rio and beyond. And of course, they'd like to acknowledge Gilberto and his amazing research team. It's been my pleasure to work with all of you over the last few years. Um, Pam Factor Litvak, another collaborator at Columbia University uh, in the Department of Epidemiology, and then the Williams Microbiome Group, um, all of these individuals who uh, contributed greatly to assessing the microbiome in this, in this study. Oh, and that's it. And I can take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, was amazing talk. Um, I, I'm gonna need to go. I have class right now. But <laughs> you guys keep talking if you have any burning questions. So come on. Uh, did you test to give probiotic? to the, the mice models. So that was actually what we put into the grant the first time that we submitted it. And the reviewers came back saying that it was premature to do that. So, so we first are going to, so our, our grant is actually composed of mechanistic studies in the mouse model as well as this translating those findings to the Brazilian mother-infant cohort. Um, but it's definitely something that, that we would like to do. And there are, have been some studies in mothers taking probiotics 
uh, where it's been shown to have beneficial impact. So, yes. Uh, that it would be more um, meaningful uh, prebiotics instead of probiotics or symbiotics mi at least. Uh, so I mean I think it depends on in what context you're talking about. So in an instance for example with acromancia let's say you're trying to treat obesity in pregnancy. Um, in that instance, and, and acromancia is currently being developed as a probiotic for that um, purpose to treat obesity. So in that instance, a probiotic may be better. But if you already have acromancia, you may want to you know, just boost the levels of acromancia that you have. In that instance, you could take a prebiotic that, you know, that usually these are like resistant fibers. I actually take primarily prebiotics rather than probiotics, but I feel like I have a pretty good digestive system, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, it's a good question. And then, you know, sort of in in the future, I think that the way the direction the field is going will really be kind of combining the two. So we'll be putting in the bacteria that are missing, but then also sup giving supplements that are going to promote the growth of that bacteria. Because just because you take a probiotic doesn't mean it's going to colonize and grow. It still needs the things that it grows the best on. Thanks. Uh, following up uh, Camila's uh, question, S uh, did you see any alterations in your mice studies? Uh, alterations in the um, offspring's um, microbiota? In your in your mice studies, uh, alteration in the offspring microbiota. So you s you saw the same as with the cohort here. Right, no, no, not the same alteration. So re recapitulate the the in the my studies recapitulate the decrease or the alterations in in the offspring. Okay, which means that you can you can modulate also the offspring. So that's probably where you're going to, yeah. So we will take pups born to mothers who got antibiotics and transfer them to mothers that didn't get antibiotics and see if that's actually correct. And then we also are going to do basically fecal transplants where we take the mother's stool microbiome from mothers that didn't get antibiotics and gavage it into the infants from mothers that did. So if they're getting to show that if they're getting exposed to a normal microbiome, you can overcome this issue. Uh, but we also have a lot of things that we're doing with the pup, with the infants themselves, because in the mouse studies I've shown here, we primarily focused on the mother and what the antibiotics are doing to the mother. But we're going to be assessing how it impacts brain development. And in mice, you can do so much more. I mean, you can take out the brain and look at gene expression. For yes. Similarities. To, to, yeah, absolutely. So in the studies that I published, we actually looked at intestinal biopsies from children with autism and we were then able to look at how sort of the host um, transcriptome may be altered as well as bacteria and how those related 
And what we found is that the children with autism were deficient in um, host enzymes involved in carbohydrate m metabolism. So these are enzymes on the epithelium that break down carbohydrates typically, but children with autism had lower levels of those. So this was actually when I started working on the microbiome because when I found that, I thought, well, that's going to change the carbohydrate milieu in the gastrointestinal tract, and then that's probably going to change the microbiome. Uh, but it's not usually, it's not ever the same tax uh, necessarily that are associated with disease. And we found in those, in the infant, or the uh, children with autism that they had the presence of a bacteria called Sutterella, and they actually had antibodies in their blood to that bacteria as well, whereas the typically developing children did not have that. So. I mean, it's a good question, like, is there a common theme to all of these things? But, but we are looking at this as, you know, a developmental model for the, Im for the infants of how this might relate to autism or other neurodevelopmental issues. I mean, we're seeing hyperactivity in the mice, so there may be some relationship to attention deficit hyperactivity, um, any range of of later, later life outcomes. I mean, even people have suggested that maybe schizophrenia, which develops in, you know, mid, early, uh, late teens, early 20s, typically, that that could be, could be related to an early life exposure. And so microbiome is, is one such exposure you might think of. So. Hey Brent, uh, what are the possible uh, explanations for the associations between microbiota and mood? Um, so the associations are sort of various, but it is really through <laughs> through the gut-brain axis, and the gut-brain axis has multiple components. There's the impact of the gut microbiome, which we know impacts inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract and inflammatory signals can have impacts in the brain. There's also the vagus nerve which directly connects the gastrointestinal tract to the brain and so there's potential for bi-directional communication between the vagus nerve and the gastrointestinal tract. But what I'm particularly looking at is tryptophan because what this mouse model shows is that it completely disrupts tryptophan metabolism when an antibiotic is taken. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just an antibiotic, but it may be other things that perturb the microbes that actually regulate tryptophan metabolism. And they're not necessarily doing it directly so it's not like the microbes are what are typically metabolizing most of the tryptophan. It's in fact our, our host genes that metabolize tryptophan, but in some way the bacteria are controlling the host gene expression. So when we give antibiotics, it knocks out that expression of those host genes, and then you see that you don't get trip the tryptophan metabolism and downstream of tryptophan metabolism are important neurochemicals like serotonin, which is it, it's of course associated with um, mood and behavior, as well as melatonin, uh, which is associated with both inflammation as well as sleep disturbances. So there's a lot of different ways that we probably don't even know in terms of all the metabolites that the microbiome is producing and that are being transported into the blood that then can reach the brain. But, but I'm focused primarily on, on tryptophan and its role in the, in the gut-brain axis. Thank you, Brent, so much for your uh, lecture. It was very interesting, and I think everyone enjoyed it. So thank you so much. <laughs>